All right, guys, how's it going? Righty-o, so as the veg uh, let me start again. Right, so as the title suggests, this is going to be a quick review of a new set of spanners that I've got. Um, but also, it's actually going to be a little bit of a, a chance for me to have a, a little bit of a rant, really, I suppose. Um, just about some of the things that I've noticed about the mechanics industry in the UK. Obviously, I can only speak for the UK. can't speak for over in the United States um, or Australia or New Zealand, wherever else you may be watching this from. But um, no, I just, I'd like to have a little bit of a rant, really, and just sort of a get an idea or obviously in the comments, if you could comment and maybe give me your opinions uh, on sort of the situation that I find myself in and perhaps maybe what I should do. That'd be pretty cool, actually. I, I'd, I'd really appreciate that. I should do. That'd be pretty cool, actually. I, I'd, I'd really appreciate that. Um, but first things first, I'd just like to say uh, cheers for watching. Um, I'm really new to this whole YouTube thing. Um, I've got I've had quite a few views on my toolbox tour. Uh, I haven't had that many views on my diagnostic tour. And uh, I don't think I've had any other views on um, the waveform for uh, one of my injectors. Was it injector or was it? No, sorry, secondary injection, I believe it was. Um, but yeah, it's one of those. It's all a learning curve. You have to work at something if you want to gain, become good at it. Um, and this is obviously me. This is me starting to work at it. Uh, so yeah, so I just want to say cheers for, thanks for watching, basically. Cheers, appreciate it. Um, so yeah, first things first, new set of spanners. These are, um, these are from Brit Tool that are owned by Facom, which are owned by Stanley. Uh, so it's like, essentially, it's Mac, Facom, Brittool, Draper. I think it might, it might be Draper or it might be Sealy. Uh, I'm not quite sure. Don't quote me on that, but I think one of the olds is owned by Stanley as well, which make the same sort of um, sort of tools, really. Um, so these are Brittool. Uh, these are the classes, the Hallmark range which is just solely based for automotive use this would be the what they class their expert line um so essentially i suppose it's it's trying to compete with the likes of uh snap on mac obviously based in the based in the us uh cornwell macco um they're a little they're, they're, i'd say they're, they're they're above your sort of pittsburgh if you're in the states this is they're above your pittsburgh state quality uh, if you're in the UK, these would be above Sealy, I think. Um, but obviously uh, above the likes of like your work zone, Aldi, Lidl, Tool, you know, B&Q sort of stuff. They're above these or they're above them, should I say. Um, my experiences using these so far, they're actually really, really good. I really like them. Um, I've always liked, again, it might be, uh, it might, I don't know, it might be just wanting to make your life easier. I've always liked extended so longer uh spanners if you're in the uk if you're in the states wrench i don't know what it would be in the in new zealand australia we all probably give them different names uh if you're in ireland well i don't even know what you, yeah it'd be a spanner in ireland wouldn't it? um so essentially i've always preferred longer spanners um just because you can get more talk on them when you try and do something it's it makes your life easier um I've found these to actually be really nice. I've used them day to day for quite a bit now. Um, I've cleaned them up, made sure I've kept them relatively clean. Uh, the chrome on them, the chrome finish is actually really nice. I don't, I don't know if this camera will pick it up. Uh, I'm using my laptop, uh, my laptop camera, which isn't the greatest. Um, but the chrome job itself is really nice. These have probably had day in, day out use for just over two months. Um, Love them, really, really like them. Just to sort of, I picked up a fifteen because it was the it was the closest one to me. Um, this is a fifteen standard from Teng. Now I don't know if you can quite so quite see the difference, but my fat thing is up way. There's a fair bit extra. There we go, do it like that. There's obviously a lot, this is a lot longer than this. Um, so you can gain a lot more leverage, you know, 
again, more talk, that sort of thing. Um, the box end is angled at a 15. I think it's a 15 degree, or it might be five based on that. Looks more. I'd say that's five, actually. I think it's a five degree offset. Um, there isn't any anti slip on the open ends, so it's not the likes of your flank drive plus your knuckle saver with your max, the Milwaukee maxi bite, something similar to that effect. Um, there's no teeth ground into the ends of, or the, the open end. And it also doesn't have, I've seen on quite a few of the uh, American ones when I've seen these tool views and stuff like that, um, like on some of your Craftsman's and your Matco's and stuff, they have an actual, like a diagonal, basically cut into either side of the of the open end. So it basically creates another V. So it sits onto your, your nut, your fastener, if you're in the States, whatever. Um, it sits onto the nut a lot better. Um, these, to be honest, I've used open-ended wires and they haven't slipped. But again, I'm not trying to crack something off. With, with, a, with a, you know, I'm not trying to crack a really stubborn nut off just using the open end. I always use the box end. Um, they're really nice though, I mean, honestly, mate, I, they feel, just in your hand, they feel really nice and weighted. Um, it's a good weight as well. It's not, Tang are a British tool company. Obviously it's a lot lighter, oh, it's a lot, sorry, smaller, but the weight wise, I'll be honest, this is a damn sight more hefty than this. And invariably, more weight, stronger, not as porous metal. Well, that's the theory behind it. I suppose that's the that's the rule of thumb theory. Um, just to have a look down. Again, it's not had lots of heavy use two months. This I don't actually think I've used this 15 in this tang set. Um, I might have done. It, basically, this is like a backup set that I have at the house. And obviously, I brought this from work. Um, so yeah i mean the again i don't you know i, I own snap-on tools i own sort of what you class as top tier high, super expensive tools i suppose um i'm not a tool snob though by any stretch of the imagination and i think if i'd love to own a set of flank drive spanners i really would but i can't justify going out and spending 250 on a set of combination spanners that will only give me size 10 to 19. this is an extra long set that cost me 80 and has gone from size 10 to 21. No, sorry, size 10. No, sorry, this is a size 10 to 19 um, on the extra long set. Now, 80 versus 250, I can buy more tools with the money that I've saved just on getting the snap-on ones. Um, don't get me wrong, I am not saying this is in the same league as the snap-on one because, quite frankly, it won't be. I do believe what you pay you get invariably however if the tool can still perform the same result now i'm not saying this is a torture test where i'm trying to snap a bolt off with the open end as i've seen some people do and that's their justification i don't know why um at the end of the day a spanner is to loosen and tighten things that's all it is there for if it can do that job what's the problem if you've got a spanner that can do that job that's longer, that means you have to put less effort in. Granted, it doesn't have some of the features that a snap-on one would. And it probably, in five years' time, will it still look like this? Whereas a snap-on one might. I don't think it will look like as clean as this and as, as the chrome might have flaked. It might look a bit battered. If, if the metal on the open end is not as high a quality, um, you'll probably see some chips maybe into it and it might have the actual ring end or the, sorry, the open end might have started to open up on the jaws slightly where the metal obviously hasn't been as high quality as perhaps what a snap-on one would be or a Mac or a Mac Co or a Cornwell, whatever. Um, then, yeah, I think at that point you can just say, well, you know what? £250 is definitely worth it. 10 years down the line, are you thinking to 250 to £350 for a set of spanners and they're still just as good as when you got a box? You can justify it, I think so, because you'd have definitely earned that money back. But for the time being, £80 for a set of longer ones that, as far as I'm concerned, I only ever really use this end for cracking off, and that is true. And if I can't get this in, I, um, I actually use crow's feet. I very rarely, I don't know why, I very rarely use this open end. The only other time I really use this is when I'm holding a cam. 
in all, in all honesty, is actually when I'm holding a cam or I'm trying to, if, if a fastener or, or a bolt, nut, whatever it is, isn't super tight and I want to get some movement on it so I can, you know, I mean, I, the, I suppose the, the, the uses that you use an open end for, there is a lot, but invariably, because this part has been designed, you always use this. Do you know what I mean? Um, as the tool goes, like I say, as the set of spanners goes, I think it's a really good buy that I got. Um, they should be around the £120 mark, no, sorry, £140 mark. Um, I got them for 80 um, I, I have quite a few, I have quite a bit of the Brit tool stuff. I have <clears throat> the long aviation ratchets, which I think I've, I've posted on the toolbox top. Um, and they, they have basically got a uh, long, basically a box end of one with a zero degree offset. So the offset is continued. And then it has a ratchet in box end. So there'd be a ratchet point, like a 12 point ratchet end on this side. Um, they're really good. I mean, I, I do a lot of engine work and gearbox work, um, pulling engines out, putting new ones in, doing clutches, doing gearbox removal and refit. Um, so invariably, those bolts are always actually quite a bit tight. They're always in some quite hard to access areas, um, extra length, hey, uh, and also leverage is at that point, it makes your life so much easier. It's just a no brainer, really. You know, I mean, when you're trying to crank on that and it digs into your hand and you know you you can just about get it into this you can get it just about get it onto something uh whereas obviously here it's much easier you aren't you haven't got a chance of you know perhaps catching you on the on a manifold that's hot or you know i mean i'm just using that as an example um but you kind of get the idea that i do think sometimes there's a, there's a time and a place there's definitely a time and a place for the smallest banner but also the vast majority of times if you need to make your life easier why not use one of these um but yeah i suppose tool wise and uh branding brand loyalty that sort of stuff top tier tool trucks versus the whole debate of should you buy tools online should you buy them off snap on so on and so on um my view is that if you can get a tool that does the same job granted it might not last as long but if that job is paying you a sum of money if you can get a spanner socket an impact whatever to get that job done um you don't spend as much on it and you can still charge for the job you've saved yourself money on the tool and you've earned money out of it that's a good that's just a great idea to me i don't understand why anybody has an argument for for that um but equally you've got to understand then that if you're buying lesser quality tools they won't last as long um perhaps the features on them aren't as good sometimes a specialty tool is just that it's a one-off tool they cost a lot but when you need it you need it you know that's just the way it is <laughs> the sad reality is that and that sometimes you know what hand tools and ratchets buy the best that you can afford purely for the fact that they will last you longer than a cheaper alternative i'd also believe that i think there's pros and cons for both quite frankly and that each individual person needs to make up their own mind on one, what they can afford, two, how long they plan on doing this for, and three, essentially, if they just want to fill out their toolbox with a certain brand or a certain thing, they want to go that way. You know, I see quite, a, I'm, I'm the same. I've got a snap-on toolbox because I got it cheap off a friend that was, I think it was third hand, not even second hand, so it had a multiple owners um and i got it with a side cab it was a top and bottom stack he kept it in really good nick and i got that for around 1500 pounds which for me i was like why wouldn't i because perhaps then the, the the reality is as well the snap-on boxes is an investment they hold their value you can if you look after them if you keep them relatively clean you know you don't ding them about you don't scratch them you do look after stuff you can sell it on if not for the same amount if not sometimes for a profit i've seen guys sell boxes for so you know it, it, just trying to be smart about things don't just instantly think that there's only one option and it is snap on mac harbor freight brick tool tang you know there's a there's, there's a time and a place for every sort of tool and every sort of tool quality if sometimes you haven't got a tool and you need to cut one cut a spanner you're not going to go and cut a hole in your snap on flank drive spanner are you i mean come on and if you do well, you're an idiot 
like you'd use a cheap 10 pound set of spanners or 15 pound set of spanners to do that just do you know what i mean so you understand yeah you know I mean? i'm trying to get my point across um but yeah so that's my new set of spanners super super happy with them used them now for a good month and a half two months solidly day in day out Done a lot of engine work and a lot of gearbox refitting uh really nice super nice they feel so good oh man i just like using them oh it, see and it, again it's that it's that attitude it makes you you enjoy picking your spanner up you enjoy doing your work do you know what i mean it's a catch-22 if you've got a set of nasty spanners that you're a bit like me nah, they don't do the job or they always slip off and you smash your knuckles up you don't want to use them you're like oh i really don't want to try and crack off that bolt i'll try and find some other way of doing it do you know what i mean it's just it's it swings and roundabouts and i think sometimes people can get kind of get a bit lost in their way of thinking i think you just need to have an open mind with a lot of this stuff really um so the other part of the video obviously that's the tool part done uh the other part that i was going to talk about and actually sort of give an idea on this will be quite a long video so i do apologize um is actually mechanic work so i've i've been a mechanic now for just over four years um i'm 26 i've done manual labor jobs my whole life and i've also worked in customer service but probably not the type of customer service that you're thinking of um so i i used to do when i my first job out of school was a uh, was at a rock climbing center i used to teach climbing um so i teach how to actually climb but also health and safety side of how to put a harness on how to tie your knots how to ascend and descend correctly um i was always interested in cars and i was always i always liked working my hands i wasn't academically intelligent to the point where i was hitting a's consistently um, I was probably a B student, I'd say, completely a little bit above average, smidge. So a couple of Bs, a couple of Cs, that sort of grading. Um, however, I've always wanted to work for myself. Um, I've always had that drive and ambition. So my first foray out of climbing instructing was to do engineering. Um, so I actually went learned how to weld did a course at my local college if you're in the states it'd be classes with community college um and went and looked at sort of options to get an apprenticeship in engineering um, either do welding uh, mechanical engineering working in a machine shop sort of stuff so essentially i got volunteered um to gain experience because at the time i believed experience was more important than money um and to a certain degree i still believe that um I worked in a machine shop for just over eight, nine, uh, yeah, just over nine months, um, made cups of tea, brews, cleaned the floor, helped with um, essentially you setting up the lathes, cutting, milling. So essentially this particular machine shop did a lot of diesel work, did a lot of press work. Um, they worked on a lot of sort of heads, blocks, doing NDT, non-destructive testing, to check. Obviously, they'd pressure test certain ones, they'd shot blast them, uh, clean up, and basically remanufacture mechanical components. What I found was, although I really, really enjoyed it, um, I didn't have the academic, I say that, I there wasn't the academic route that I wanted to go down. Um, so I wanted to get an apprenticeship. I wanted the qualification as well as the experience. That's what I believed was the best route um that wasn't an option uh and nobody else in that particular area was hiring for an apprentice at the time so after obviously volunteering there uh, i went back into climbing i went back into an instructor whilst i was there i got talking to one of my close friends um and he did rope access work which is something i went into um so rope access is working at height essentially using ropes as the means of access so what i mean by that is when you see someone working from a ladder rather than working from a ladder or a scaffold or a cherry picker or a, a mupe multi elevated work platform rather than working off one of them um you'd base the abseil either down from the top of the building uh, if it was a steel structure you would use something called aid climbing which would be uh, points of attachment on the steel beams it could be in the form of a steel straw, 
and you would essentially attach them to a harness to you and you'd manoeuvre about across these structures in order to carry out work that was needed. Um, I did that for just over four years, so I left that one just 21. Uh, and I'll be honest, it was the best experience that I've had to date work-wise. It was absolutely phenomenal, brilliant. Self-employed basis, um, worked as a subcontractor. <clears throat> your work, work ethic, your attitude got you the next job. Very small industry, got much bigger now, um, but at the time it was still relatively small. <clears throat> you could do a lot of work um, where you'd essentially, you, you know, it, it, a lot of people make the misconception with rope access where it's working at height and it's just about getting and um, being comfortable working at height. It's not. At the end of the day, if you're sat on the end of a rope and you're faced with a building, you have to know construction skills. You have to know sort of engineering stuff, how to use tools, so on and so on. So your job could be painting, for example. It could be rewiring a, a, a sign, a light, for example. So you need to understand about electrics. Um, it could be steel erecting. You could be in putting out up a steel frame, steel girder on a, on a pre-existing building. You could be taking one down. Uh, a lot of different skills and, and, and abilities are needed in it. Uh, and I was always, I was, I essentially had to leave that industry, um, sadly, uh, at the time, due to personal circumstances. So I essentially left there, thought, right, what am I going to do? What, what are my, um, what are my options, basically? And I thought, well, I can swing the spanner. I'm interested in cars. I, you know, I've worked on cars before in my, obviously at home, in my garage, done oil changes, changed tires, um, that sort of stuff and I thought I can swing a spanner I'll become a mechanic and that was basically that was my thought process I wasn't green green I wasn't you know a complete noob but obviously I understood about mechanics I understood about engineering the mechanical side of things more so I could use hand tools I could use power tools so I thought eh how hard can it be famous last words um so I went to college I basically got a, a part-time job in uh, waiting on doing bar work um at this point i'm 22 around that um got a lot of life well obviously from doing rope access danger money working at height did a little bit of offshore work um i'd saved up a, a reasonable amount of money um and sort of was living quite a good lifestyle let's put it that way uh bit of reality check bumped down to earth working part-time thought right i'll go to college i'll do my automotive stuff so in the states it'd be classed as a community college uh mm -hmm. so i basically then worked at part-time whilst at college and i realized when i was at college uh, and i'd first started up a lot of the guys were apprentices based on my age because i was 22 uh, in the uk at least I know some Americans believe that the apprenticeship scheme is the right way to go and it's great and stuff. It is. That is very true. It is a great idea. You learn hands-on and you learn the theory, um, either in block release or day release. Uh, there is limits on funding. So I, being a bit of an idiot, thought, I've got enough money to survive. I'll sort of quit my part-time job that was paying my bills because, again, I had quite a large sum of pot of money basically sat in my savings account that I could use just to pay bills and stuff and thought I'll volunteer at a garage in order to gain experience again believing experience is is the key in this you know it's all good knowing the book side of stuff but equally you need to be able to do it in practice so I have essentially then volunteered at a garage free labor no pay for a full year right I expected the bloke to basically go after six months. I'll tell you what, mate, you're doing pretty well. Uh, you've come a long way. I'll start paying you. That didn't happen. Um, but again, I wasn't fussed because I was getting experience. However, the experience then kind of wasn't getting any progress. Let's put it that way. So I started off doing tires, doing brakes, doing suspension so on and so on doing services 
And it got to a point where then he wasn't showing me anymore. Oh, sorry, no, tell a lie. Uh, I'd started doing electrical diagnosis with him. So I was doing engine performance issues, misfires, um, sort of any quite relatively easy electrical diagnosis. You know, uh, horn wasn't working, um, washer jet wasn't working, but it all, obviously electric, there's an electronic control in that system. Therefore, diagnosing the electrical side first before you blame the mechanical side, that sort of stuff. Um, as this was the case, and then as obviously, as you can imagine, the savings started to slightly dwindle, um, I then went and looked around. Um, so I managed to actually secure a paid position with a garage in a, in a different town. Um, so I actually then basically just said, I went back to the guy and said, sorry, I can't volunteer for you anymore. And his response actually quite shocked me. It was, um, he was like, oh, no, no, don't go. I can now pay you. And I was a bit like, it kind of took me back a little bit because I was kind of, I'm loyal to a fault is probably the way I should put it. Um, I think people can sometimes see my good nature and kind of not take a, well, yeah, take advantage essentially of my good nature and my, of my situation. Um, and the, the problem that I f then faced was I was like, this guy's gave me an opportunity. He gave me an option. But I, I, head versus heart, do you know what I mean? And my heart was telling me, he's only going to pay you cash in hand, which means you're not a contract. He could get rid of you and say there's no work in three days and you're not going to get paid. And he wasn't offering that much. He wasn't offering even as much as the other place was. So as loyal as I was to him, and for the free labour that he got from me, he definitely made money, let's put it that way. I, I got to a point where it wasn't taking an awful lot of time to show me, and I was doing the jobs for him. Um, I was super thankful for the opportunity, but I was then like, I need to do it on my own terms now. You know, I need to do this for me sort of thing. Um, went to this next place. Fast forward three years, was sort of round about probably it's been about seven or eight months ago. Um, no, sorry, six months ago. Yeah, it will be six months. Um, I then basically worked at this shop for three years. So I obviously went in there knowing about breaks, a little bit of a uh, diagnostic work, servicing, that sort of stuff. From there, I have then basically gone and done gearbox replacement, all heavy line stuff, timing belts, timing chains, um, balance shafts on Mitsubishi L200, you know, working on everything. I've even worked on milk trucks in this place, like literally, do you know what I mean? Like I, it isn't just light vehicle automotive, you know, anything that came in through those doors, I'd pretty much work on. Um, and it got to a point in that period where I'd kind of reached my potential in that garage. Um, quite a few differences in regards to where me as a young technician, that business owner as owning his garage and making money, were going in different directions. I can see industry going electric, hybrid, possibly fully electric in the not too distant future, 10, 15, 20 years, more than likely, if the infrastructure gets put in place. He was still more fussed about pure bottom line. I get it. He's a business owner. I understand that. But by not investing in your business and still expecting a return is, quite frankly, stupid, in my opinion. Please comment. Like I say, comment and you know, any, any, any of these areas that you think um, I'm right or I'm wrong, whatever it may be, um, I'd love to hear your opinion. So essentially I'm in a situation with this particular garage owner where I'm doing everything. And I mean everything. I'm now diagnosing vehicles with body control issues, um, essentially, uh, you know, PCM issues, this sort of stuff. Um, he, when I first got there, he was very keen to ship it out because he didn't understand. Or he didn't want to learn really, I think is the term. He's quite an old school guy. He's still was knocking around on carburetors fuel injection came in it was a bit mm, and now it's you know fuel injection with pulse width modulation controls everything's got a module literally everything has a module now controlling it um and quite frankly he hasn't kept up with the times so 
as a result, I then bought scope um, because I wanted to even further myself further. Um, I got laughed at, I got ridiculed, I got mocked, quite frankly, a bit humiliating. Um, and as a young technician, you know, three years into it, I'm not young by age wise. And quite frankly, I find it a bit embarrassing, really, the fact that, you know, people ridicule someone to better themselves because they don't either, they haven't got, they're scared of failing, in essence, is most likely the, the reason they don't want to seem like they don't know the answers, is what I've noticed. But I don't believe you can succeed in this particular, in mechanics, in the automotive field, without failing. It's changing at such a speed that you you can't you can't know everything you literally cannot know everything and to assume you can and assume that you can fix something and assume that you can just get by by doing what you're doing is so arrogant it is so arrogant it's you know i i don't like well i mean i'm gonna start swearing because he quite frankly he, it's fucking disgusting really to think that you can get away with that and I, I, as a as a young mechanic, trying to, I, I want to reach my potential. I want to be the best mechanic, technician, whatever you want to class yourself as. I want to be the best that at least I can be. I am not going to bring anybody else down. If you can fix that, that misfire by taking a coil and plug off, transferring it to another cylinder, and you've noticed that it's transferred, you've used your scan data, you've used a scan, a PID data, and you're saying, right, it's that coil. You put a coil on that car and it fixes it. You've diagnosed the issue. No matter how how the, the, the testing method that you've used, it's worked because you realize that it is a coil at fault. Granted, it could be the wire into the coil or the coil. But by that system's definition, you need to replace the coil. It comes with the wire. You fix the car. The likes of Scanner Dana um frank massey in the uk um pico scopes scoping that is it's now becoming the norm which is awesome quite frankly we are now being able to test mechanical things with an electronic device because most mechanical things pressure hydraulic um rotation crankshafts the engine itself camshafts any they all have sensors attached to them you can view the mechanical process electronically. And now we're getting to a stage where the mechanical processes are being removed and it's purely an electrical process. Motors, you know, solenoids, that's just a, that's literally a linear motor that moves something from side to side, in and out. It's an actuator. You look at hybrids, they have an electronic generator essentially attached to a, a mechanical combustion motor you look at a fully electric car that is a traction motor that is all that is that is literally a big stepper motor and you've gone from carbs fuel injection mechanical mechanical electrical fully electrical and my problem that i've got is that in the uk at least the people that i've gone to and sought to better myself with an in that sounds a bit bad sought to better myself in their environment it's been the wrong type of environment now obviously four four years in now i have just and this is kind of where it gets interesting so i then left that garage because i felt like you know i was being ridiculed essentially i was being not bullied but essentially i was being laughed at when i crack out a scope um Perhaps it's the fact that my scope is, is a Chinese piece of shite. I don't know. It does the job. Don't get me wrong. It's not a Pico scope and it's not all got the singing bells and whistles. But I learned how to use it. I cut my teeth on it. And quite frankly, it made me and him money. So, you know, really, I should be the one laughing because I took that option away from him. Whatever. Um, I then thought the grass was greener and I went to a dealership in the area. Um that do a lot of that, that said in the interview they do training they were looking for a diagnostic technician that also like to get his hands dirty that's i like to think of myself as that you know um so i went down worked there for six months 
As a result, no training plan, no individual marquee models or training plan certification. Um, and I basically got thrusted straight into sort of the hierarchy system, obviously, as a dealership, it does a political way. Uh, there's different levels. <clears throat> Based on the experience that I've got already, um, the service manager gave me quite a lot of, of engine work, of gearbox and clutch work. Um, and then when it actually got in there and I realised the amount of diagnostic work that came in or lack thereof, I then realised that actually they weren't looking for a diagnostic technician they were just looking for a technician that could do a lot of engine and mechanical work, um, which then brought me sort of back around to where I am. So I essentially, I then started looking because it was in the six months probation. I then asked, I, I was completely open and honest. I asked, this, I asked the manager, I said, you know, when you took me on, I said, obviously how you said, uh, I'd get put on diagnostic training programs and we'd be covering a lot of diagnostic work. We haven't anything really come in, not recalls, not warranty work from the brand new models. Um, why is that? I asked the question. And as soon as I asked the question, it was like, I I might as well run over the guy's dog. I literally might as well have killed his dog right in front of him. Um, his attitude was like, you shouldn't ask this. Uh, you've only just started there. You don't know the way it works, blah, blah, blah. It's like, right, okay, well, I'm in a six month probation. Kind of threw my toys out the pram. Again, not probably the best idea. Um, hindsight's 2020. Didn't really have a backup plan either, actually, which is very stupid. Uh, money wise, definitely not at the stage that I was previously when I left Rope Access. Um, kind of spat me dummy out and said, right, sod you, sod your dealership. Uh, in my six month probation, here's me notice. I'm working it. See you later, John. Bon voyage. So I pushed my toolbox out with a big smile on my face, thinking, I'll go and actually get somewhere. Well, not actually, no, sorry, I take that back. I didn't push it out with a smile on my face. I pushed it out with a bit of disappointment, actually. Um, I'm struggling. I'm not going to lie. I am struggling. In the, in the UK automotive scene, as a technician, I think the, the, there are multiple issues in the sense of it falls down online. That's all that everyone cares about. So I didn't get given certain jobs on particular models or particular because certain people would be faster. But my argument is that you're only as good as your weakest technician. In essence, if you don't, if you're, if, if your technicians aren't all trained to a certain standard, which in dealerships, strictly speaking, they should be, and an aftermarket, really, if the weakest link, that's as, that's as what you're good as, essentially. Your garage is only, or your dealership, your workshop area, is only as good as your weakest technician, is the way I view it. So if you were refusing or not, prepared to put younger technicians on training programs, or if they want to better themselves, you then ridicule them and say, why are you doing that, et cetera, et cetera. You look like an idiot. You know, that'll never catch on, blah, blah, blah. Um, I don't get it. I don't understand it. I don't understand it. In an industry that is renowned for change, right, where people were, where those guys themselves would have been laughing at, the older guys back then that were working on carbs when fuel injection came out and they'd just finished college or, or whatever and they understood it because they were getting taught it in college and then they got put on these training programs and they were figuring it out as they went along but the old guys couldn't keep up. I don't get how they can instantly forget that they were once that young guy trying to progress and trying to understand more about the newer technology coming in. And the fact that I don't seem to do that I really struggle understanding why. So, long story short, I have now been, it'll be just over a month and a bit that I haven't been in a garage. Professional garage, this is. Um, 
so I've still been doing a fair bit of side work. Now the problem obviously with that is liability issues, so on and so on. So I've only been doing it for family and friends. Uh, I'm on the verbal contract that I will fix their car as and when, and they're quite happy with that. Um, I am obviously looking for roles and stuff, but I suppose the problem that I've got is I don't really know where I should go from here. My other option is actually, I've actually been looking at setting up on my own with only four and a bit years experience, um, looking at sort of essentially looking at getting a startup loan, looking at premises um, and just focusing on the thing that I've done the most, but with an option to uh, essentially go down more into electronic and, and hybrid and electrical sides. So I was actually looking at opening just a, a pure engine and clutch garage, working on basically vehicles that have just come out of warranty, so just after three years, up to around eight years old, nine years old, where it would be economical, i.e. a customer would get a return, <coughs> and I could make money as a business by putting an engine in a car that is up to eight years old, that will get another at least, let's say, let's say for example, in the UK, the charge is, I don't know, 1400 pounds labor, uh, 1200 pounds labor for, a, for that, that includes a reconditioned unit, say, let's say it's a really cheap car uh, and it was around the grand to put an engine in, that includes labor. Um, would they then get £1,000 worth of motoring of use out of that car? I think after the age of eight years, nine years, ten years, sometimes if it's a really, if it's been neglected, not looked after, or if it's a budget type vehicle, I think the answer would be no. Um, and equally, invariably, you always find that after that time, people themselves don't want to don't want to spend the money on the vehicles quite frankly because they believe they can spend a little bit more on getting a brand new vehicle which in sometimes is correct so as far as i'm concerned if i was looking at opening up a garage i would look at focusing on clutch work engine refit refurb and rebuild uh, which is something that i've took good interest in i've started doing at home obviously now having a spare bit of time on my hands um and so on so yeah, I'd like to just obviously if, if if a lot of people view it or if if you view it, could you give me a could you give me some comments and some feedback on what you think on perhaps if you're from the states or from the UK doesn't really matter um, and just sort of give me give me a bit of feedback on like what you guys think the industry is like, what you guys think your working life is like if you're happy, you know at the end of the day we all got in, we we all go to work to earn money that is the the reason why we work but i believe that if you're happy in your work and you get a sense of not excitement well yeah excitement you're you're, you're happy you want to go to work then why not you know obviously if you don't like the video if it's a bit long i know it's a bit long uh, again i'm completely new to youtube so i don't even know how to edit really i probably should look into editing perhaps it'd make it more enjoyable for you guys to watch you'd be more inclined maybe um but yeah, obviously, if you can get, if you get an idea or any opinions, leave them in the comments section below. Um, I'll be putting up a bit more content, a bit more regular, I think. Um, it's just sort of time and and that has just been an absolute, like I say, my, my head's sort of been all over the show. I've been trying to do a lot of different things and trying to help friends and family and so on. Um, also, this is a really cup. Don't you can read that. But that's basically my attitude at the moment. Ugh. Green tea. Um, but yeah, again, um, just want to say thanks for watching. Obviously, if you've made it to the end, it's 40, nearly 45 minutes I've been rambling on. Christ. Um, if you've made it to the end, thank you. Happy days. Love you, man. And woman, whoever it is. Um, again, like obviously if you do if you don't dislike it everything's constructive at the end of the day in it 
everyone's subjective. You might like what I'm talking about. You might not. You might like my squeaky voice. You might not. Um, if you want to see more content, subscribe again. Um, if you want it as it comes out, I believe you can press the bell notification, uh, the little icon on the side somewhere, and it'll, uh, it'll basically every time I put out a video, it'll show it. Okie okay, dokie, okay. that's, uh, that's pretty much it, guys. So, again, obviously, if you stayed this far, super appreciate it. Thank you. Any comments, any ideas, even stuff like perhaps a video that you'd like me to shoot, uh, perhaps you want me to talk about something uh, that I've already gone through, like what life was like doing rope access or um, what those garages, what I was doing specifically in those garages. Uh, even even some brand new young lads starting out in the automotive field, um, what sort of tools perhaps you can get, you know, sort of brands versus like a comparison, you know, brand versus brand or spanner versus spanner, wrench versus wrench if you're in the States. Um, whatever it is, man, that'd be, that'd be really cool. Okay, guys, um, have an awesome weekend and take it easy. See you later.